Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Huh. Did you see that? I didn't get that last time. Of course, I'm not sure I got that this time. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother. Okay, that's fine. You know, we've gone over verse 1 probably 10 times. <laughs> but look at this. Look, did, you, did you read verse 2? I mean, did you listen? Did you, I mean, check it out. Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, comma, stop, listen, pay attention, right there. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. It doesn't say the Corinthians. It says the church of God that's at Corinth, the location of the church. That's kind of interesting to me. Father, I thank you for this intensity with which we are looking intensely at the word of God. I thank you that in your perspective, you already know what you want as a directive to teach us. You already know as far as what the needs are of each individual person to hear from you and how they need to be spoken to. So you're able to do that, O Holy Spirit, by your sovereign will to give a person ears to hear, no matter what I say, what you want said, they will hear. So God, I thank you for that, that we can turn our lives over to you and open our mouth and let you speak and teach as you choose to. So God, this night, this day, this place, and this way, I ask you to take over the will, the way, and the purpose that you've designed this study to cause us to be oh so immensed and immersed in the Word of God that the intensity with which you created the universe will create in us a place for this Word to go forth and accomplish its purpose that is designed for us to hear so that we would have heard your voice today. We would have known you today and we can take something from this practically and live by it today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, that's pretty cool, man. I, can I pray that again? <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I like getting comfortable, so I, I just can't do this, you know? This isn't set up right, so you're going to have to give me a minute here to kind of make a mess of my mess so that I can take my time cleaning it later, but that I can get comfortable. Because what I do is I move these settings around so that I can do sound or I can do everything from my point of view or my my uh, camera angle. But then I don't feel comfortable unless I feel comfortable. And that means that i got to move a chair over here. Because if you've ever seen me in action, you already know that we don't do things by professionalism. We do things that we enjoy. As a matter of fact, we do things to get comfortable. So if you need to go get a cup of coffee real quick, go get a cup of coffee. If you need to uh, grab a Pepsi, grab a Pepsi. Hey, if you're drinking beer, drink beer. I don't care. It's not here. <laughs> That's better. Ah. Thank you, Lord. Boy, you know... Do you ever get tired like that? You know, where you just want to relax. Sit back. Get into a good book. Read. I kind of like to get into a good study, you know, and see what seems to be less obvious to other people, but becomes extremely blatantly, overtly obvious to me when I look at it. It's like, almost as though it were for the first time and I just kind of I kind of get amazed by it because it's like unto the church of God which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus it doesn't say to the Corinthians it says to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus so this isn't written to Corinthians do you get it here 
unto the church of God which is at Corinth. So first of all, we're talking about the church that's at Corinth, the church of God. Now, I'm not calling the church of God denomination or, you know, things like that. I'm just saying, you know, this is an assembly of God, an assembly of people that, you know, are under the name of God or however you want to call it. But it's the church of God, which is at Corinth, but to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So this is written to them, not to everyone, not to all people, not to all the ones that happen to be at Corinth, not to the Corinthians in general. This is written only to the church of God, and it's written only to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. With all, oh, wait a minute now, here's the all, oops, we better back up, Corinthian. With all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Oh, so this is written to all who call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, that's kind of interesting. So, this letter, written to Corinthians, is for the church of God, which is at Corinth. So, it's for the church. But it's also for those that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, set apart, that are in Jesus, you know, that, that know Jesus, that are called to be saints. In other words, they're not there yet. They're not perfect. You know, they're, they're called to be saints, but they're not saints. And yet, with all that is in every place, call upon the name of Jesus. Why would he say, with all that are in every place? Hmm, could there be other people in that church that are meeting some other place? Called in every place in Corinth. Now, Corinth, we know, was a thriving community. No offense, but if there were any Jews around, two Jews, three synagogues, you know, I have no problem with believing that there were more than one place for the people to gather together in order to be a church. I understand that this isn't called the Corinthian church or those that are in Thessalonica, but it's called the church of God, which is at Corinth. So I kind of get an idea that maybe Paul is hinting at something. Maybe Paul is saying, all of you at Corinth that are the church of God, meaning he's trying to give a hint that just because you weren't part of that one part of the body, that maybe there's some people that are out there that are kind of like not inside the church that are dealing with some issues. So whatever reason they're there, I don't know, but it looks to me like there's a couple of groups here. To them, who's them, that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all. Now, you don't have to say with all unless it's them that's different than the others. Do you get it? In other words, the English here is being very specific about there being two groups here all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, their Lord and our Lord. So there must be another group here that calls upon the name of the Lord to be saved. There must be a group there that's also them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints. So we have two groups that Paul is writing to and he's calling both of those groups the church of God at Corinth. Do you get that? Do you see that in there? I do. Because you see, I kind of understand that. Because in modern days, if I'm a Corinthian, which I am, you know, I mean, I'm like you. I'm carnal at times. I'm spiritual at times. I'm gifted with the Holy Spirit. I've got manifold fruits of the Spirit that are kind of like bananas and fruits and cherries, you know, and blossoms and trees and bees and all that other stuff going on in my life, just like you. But... Do you kind of get the picture that maybe there's more to this separation of these two groups or these multiple groups than meets the eye? That maybe there's a group of people that are sanctified. You know, they're set apart. They set themselves apart on purpose, you know, to be set apart, called to be saints. They're, they're meant to be saints. They're over here somewhere or they're out there somewhere. And they're part of the church of God. But then there's also them that call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. They are another group that's calling upon the name of the Lord. And I've always said that you know, like Jesus said, they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And quite frankly, these guys are calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And so, he's saying that these two groups, underneath the banner of the church of God, that they are saying the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both their Lord and our Lord. In other words, it may be that the two groups have some distinction that makes them different from each other, but it's still one Lord. Do you see how he's saying that? Their Lord and our Lord. 
our Lord is our Lord, but their Lord is their Lord too. So, who are we talking to? Are we talking Jew and Gentile? I don't think so. I don't think Paul was making that kind of distinction about there being some kind of like, oh, well, now we're going to make a distinction between the Jew and the Gentile. I think that somehow there was beginning that division of that separation of different people choosing to follow one way or another way. That as we see in Corinth being that metropolitan area, there may have been people that were a little more carnal as we see later on and, you know, spiritual. But there may have been some people that were a little too spiritual that may not have been carnal enough. You see what I mean? Sometimes people that get so spiritual get so puritan, you know, that they want to be saints. You know, they want to be so holy that they kind of separate themselves and make themselves into like being very dogmatic or very legalistic, very structured. Called to be saints could probably be those because... Everybody's a saint. Paul mentions that later. But called to be a saint is either one of two things. Either he's saying they're unsaved. <laughs> God forbid that they're already sanctified because quite frankly, I don't think that's what it applies because the first point that he makes is that they are sanctified in Christ, which is okay. You know, I mean, God says he sets apart or sanctifies those that are in the home of the believer. So there could be unbelievers in the house of the believer because they don't believe yet, but they are sanctified according to the purposes of God so that they would become believers. It's a promise that's given to every believer that if you're the one in the home that's saved, your family will probably be set apart and worked on. And if that's true, that would be one explanation. But it also can mean that they were sanctified in Christ to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Because they're in Christ Jesus, they're saved and they're moved on in some ways. They're in the process of being developed by God into being set apart for His purposes. Sanctified in Christ Jesus, which is the same meaning. Both can apply. God is big enough to handle both as large and as able as He is by His Spirit to have both applicable to today, to the Corinthian that you are, or the Corinthian that I am down the street, or that we you know, travel long distances to get together in one city to be called the body of Christ. Paul here calls it the church of God. You know, It's a good thing, I think, to have that distinction and to make this a very interesting point, because if we don't look intensely at it, and we don't intensify our search, then we may miss certain points that might make us able to understand and accept our brothers and sisters that aren't the same as us. That they may have a different way of looking at some things, but at the same time have the same Lord, Jesus Christ. They may call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, even as we did, in order to be saved. But they may have some other distinction that they may not be quite as holy as we are, or maybe they are more holy than we are. That maybe they're the ones and we're the ones that are on the outside and they're the ones that are trying to work their way, you could say, so to speak, in a more dogmatic way to be a saint. It could be the early formation of the papacy and the, the Roman Catholic Church or the Catholic Church, you know, the militant church, the church that was moving in a very distinctive manner that seemed to be very holy or very pious, very wanting to be sainthood very wanting to be saintly. Now, I don't mind saints. You know, saints are good people. I like the saints. You know, I like all of them, man. They're kind of good. I kind of like godly, though, though. You know, I like godliness, you know, that something with godliness is great gain. I can't even remember. I don't think it's prosperity, but... Patience with godliness? No. Something with godliness is great gain. I like godliness more than I like sainthood. Now, anybody can be a saint, you know, and called to be a saint. You know, it's like, well, I'm glad everybody's called to be a saint. And I kind of look at it that way because I think everybody's a saint. And they're all called to be saints. But not many are godly. You know, I, I, I reserve that terminology to a select few that I see as godliness or exercising a godly life. So I find it interesting when I'm looking at this that, you know, when I consider that Corinth was full of carnal Christians and spiritual Christians, and ignorant Christians, and intelligent Christians, and all kinds of groups of people all getting together at different times. No wonder there's a mishmash, a mishmash, you know, kind of a goulash, kind of a like, you know, fluffing and stuffing, you know, kind of like everything was happening so fast, so quickly that everything was all mixed up. And so Paul is getting ready to probably deal with some of the subjects about all of this going on while at the same time 
having to address everyone from inside and outside. I don't think of anybody being outside. Now, I'm kind of weird because I figure that the church is this big old giant thing that God said, hey, you're all in it, you're all of it, you all be with it. You know, I figure, well, okay, covers me. You know, so I figured, okay, you got me covered. You know, and then I look at a letter seven church and I go, well, you know, okay, you know, I'd rather not be in that one and that one and that one and that one. I want to be in that one, you know. But, you know, I find myself in one or the other. And unfortunately, we see ourselves as the rich church in America because, quite frankly, every church in America is rich. I don't see any poor churches in America. I'm sorry. I don't care if you're in a cardboard box church, you know, you're still rich in America compared to overseas. You're still rich. Sorry, you know, you've got opportunity. You know, that's the point. So, that also shows some of the weaknesses and some of the failings and some of the problems we have and why we're dealing with what we're dealing with because of being a rich church that we think we're, you know, lack nothing when we need everything and we're poor and naked, you know, and we really don't have it all together. And the more that I listen to people talk to me about what they think they should do with their life, the more I realize how poor and naked and, you know, foolish they are. Emperor's new clothes. The church hasn't grown. The church has shrunk. There aren't more people going out and wanting to live their life as missionaries. There are more people that are wanting to be Christian doc. Well, doctors are fine. Christian football players, Christian basketball players, Christian knock 'em, sock 'em, beat 'em, kill 'em fighters. You know what I mean? MMA wrestlers for Christ or whatever it may be. Kind of seeing a compromise here, but maybe that's just me. So when I see Paul writing this, I think he's covering everyone that is involved in the church. I think that he really wants to address all of us Corinthians, whether we're trying to be holy, whether we're trying to be righteous, whether we're trying to be godly, whether we're trying to be a saint, whether we're trying to be sanctified, whether we're just calling on the name of the Lord because we're just humble, you know, we're just we we know we're sinners, man. We can't even walk into church doors, you know, without feeling convicted. You know, everyone is covered in this Paul addressing those that are at Corinth being the church of God. And the thing I like about it is that the reason why I feel very comfortable about saying this is because of the next line. I feel very joy-filled and very practical about what we can draw from a conclusion at the end of this study from the next line. I'm glad that he put that there because otherwise I wouldn't know how to practically make this fit. <laughs> what can I take out of this for today to work in my life today? You know, How could God be speaking to me today? Simple. He is. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, grace be unto you. Oh, man, yeah, okay. We're all saved. So you see, grace is that great explanation that Paul tries to give all the time by simply saying, hey, grace be unto you. And then you got to try to figure out what it is. Well, what do you mean grace be unto you? What about just like peace be unto you? No, grace. Because you know, that isn't what he's saying. Peace be unto you would have been shalom aleichem, would have been something that is common to Jewish expression. And that's why I kind of laugh because it's like grace and peace is kind of a Gentile. Grace was given to the Gentiles. And peace be unto you is always said to Jews. Peace be unto you. The peace of God that passes all understanding. The prince of peace coming to those children and the lost children of Israel, to the children of Israel first. The, the, the peace, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the peace to come to the nation of Israel because it's a nation at unrest and is not at peace. Until the Prince of Peace comes, there shall be no peace in Jerusalem. There shall be no peace in the people. There shall no, be no peace even though the false Messiah will come and initiate a false sense of peace. And in reality, sudden destruction comes when they say peace and safety. So I do find it interesting when he says, Grace be unto you and peace. Peace, he would have said, grace be, I can't even think of the Hebrew way of saying grace, but anyways, grace be unto you and shalom alechem. Grace be unto you, peace be unto you. From God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be interesting that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, that that would be the definition of grace because it would be to everyone, Jew and Gentile, because everyone's in the world. But the peace, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, but the peace would be from... Jesus because he gives us the peace that passes all understanding. He prayed for his disciples and he said, Peace be unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. 
In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything in thanks and praise give. Thanks and praise, such a will be done. Well, anyways. Basically, <laughs> be anxious for nothing, but God will give you peace. You know, <laughs> there you go. How's that sound for intensity and intensely avoiding, you know, not remembering that scripture very clearly? But with a headache, I'm doing pretty good. But uh, peace, peace. Ooh. Ow, that hurt. But giving that blessing of grace be unto you was that, hey, you're forgiven. Remember that. Grace be unto you. You're, you've been blessed. Remember that. Grace be unto you. Hey, everything's covered. Remember that. Grace be unto you. You're not going to mess up. It's okay. You'll be okay. Grace. Grace be unto you. That's kind of why I like that. Because I need that every day of my life. I need to be able to look at my day and say, What a mess. Grace be unto you. Oh, yeah. That's right. Grace be unto me. I need grace today. Don't you? We're told every day that we should approach the throne of God and ask for grace because grace for grace, that we might approach the throne of grace to receive grace for the day. Mercy. Grace is mercy. And so, I find myself needing His mercy, obviously, because look at me, man, I'm a mess. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm pretty messed up, man. You know, like, oh, I got a headache. No, I'm kidding. But besides being messed up, besides that, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be unto you and the grace of our Father means that God will look at you and see you better than you can see yourself. God is going to gaze at you and see, frankly, great grace given to you because He loves you. He's extending towards you His mercy and demonstrating His love through the venue and the avenue of grace being that action of love that He can allow you to come into his presence and to have fellowship with him because he is a holy God and you would not be able to even be in near or around him except it be for grace and we're told by grace you're saved so I like knowing when I look at my day and I mess up like I did today I messed up today big time it's like oh man not again messed up oh boy I hate it Lord I'm screwed up. I don't want to do nothing. And the Lord says, Grace be unto you. And I go, Well, okay, if you say so. Do you mean it? Grace be unto you. Really? You mean I, even though I messed up, I can still have grace? Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Now, it's not to say go out and sin, although we do. It says that grace is still appropriate to us. We've been appropriated a certain amount of grace during this age of grace, during this time when the Holy Spirit is constraining the enemy from us, but you know, restraining the evil one from coming, but at the same time applying to us by his nature great grace to us. That we might learn to grow out of the childishness that we so often run into and act like, and that we might grow up into the full knowledge of the Son of God in us so that we would live our lives that even through death we would accomplish his life, his will, his way, and for his glory, he would receive that with which our lives would have had some meaning. We would have died in the faith, not outside of it. And so I find that greatly comforting in a practical way because then I can look at my day and say, yeah, you know, maybe I didn't handle it the best way possible. Grace be unto you. Maybe I kind of blew that guy off, you know, and kind of like, no, 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 no. Grace be unto you. Maybe, you know, I wasn't the best husband to my wife today. Although I was. <laughs> I'm pretty good at it. Grace be unto you. <laughs> oh, boy. Once she sees this video, I'm in trouble. <laughs> what do you think? Eh. Yeah, I know. We're in trouble. It's his fault. The bear did it. I didn't do it, honey. He told me. So... Grace being unto me, I can get away with statements like that because you learn to give grace because you've received grace. Paul was given great grace because he had gone out and persecuted the church. He had participated in those activities that had caused even Stephen to die and caused others to be persecuted and rounded up. He had actually devastated the church in some ways, although God turned it around and used it in a better way because they were not just devastated, they were sent out in the way they were supposed to go out in the first place. But Paul didn't know that. 
So what appeared to be devastation was the word getting spread by his persecution of the church. But because he was so passionate about his faith, because he was so adamant about his relationship, because he was so intense and intensely devoted to God, God knocked him off his horse. <laughs> Just like he'll do you. <laughs> you really want to know God? He'll let you know him. Bam! He'll smack you around. You know who you're picking on? You're picking on me, dude. And that's sometimes we need to realize that Paul's life was turned around because of grace. It was God's favor, God's sovereign will, God's decision to choose to save Paul in spite of himself. And he did. He just knocked him over, knocked him down, and said, Here I am. Get up off the ground. Watch this. I'm going to show you what you need to do. And gradually, Paul proved by way of following through with his life that he had heard from the Lord and he had done the things God said and he did go more so to discover and learn more than what he knew before and opened up his eyes to a complete continuity of this whole teaching on grace that the Gentiles would be saved and blew his mind. So the grace that was given to the Gentiles was actually given from the Father to the entire world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That's the grace that we've been given. And then the peace that passes all understanding is that which Jesus wanted for us to have, which is from the Holy Spirit. He breathed upon them, peace be unto you. He said to them, peace be unto you. He prayed that they would get together and wait for the Spirit of God to come upon them, that they would receive power. And that fruit of the Spirit was made manifest in their life as it grew up in them, as they became more and more dependent upon the Holy Spirit for their living and their life and their existence, as they sold everything and had everything in common. Because they didn't depend upon a church of money being sent. They depended upon God. They realized and recognized that God was their sustenance. And so they had that intimacy of knowledge and relationship that because they were dependent, great signs and wonders accompanied them. And they were so adamantly dependent that even death itself happened at the feet and the or at the feet at the yeah, at the feet of Peter, but at the foot of the disciples seeing that God was serious about what he was doing in every man's life. If they were that serious about following him, and he was that serious about taking them at his word. And so Ananias and Sapphira failed because of what came out of their mouth. They could have said at any point in time and been forgiven. And grace would have been extended to them. But they chose not grace. And they didn't accept the peace of God. And they wound up dying for the lack of knowing who they were speaking to. I'm glad of this line. Because if I had to worry about Ananias and Sapphira, I'd be terrified too. I'd be worried, hey, you know what? There's a bunch of people in that church of God at Corinth. There's a bunch of people that are sanctified. Matter of fact, there's a bunch of people that are saints and called to be saints. But there's also a bunch of people that just call upon the name of the Lord. And you know, Lord, I can't figure all them out. But you know what? As long as you say grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, I know that it'll be okay because in grace I find peace. That's where your answer will always lie. You are saved by grace. Because if you seek to find your solution for absolution of your sin and guiltiness and guilt bloodness or blood guiltiness, you know, things that you think you can get away with and do because the land lets you or the people let you or the laws let you or God's let you so far because of grace, then you're wrong. Spiritually, you're devastating your soul by killing people or taking blood or doing things that are contrary to creation's laws. There are laws that existed from the beginning of creation. Thou shalt not kill is one of them. It doesn't matter what you're killing. Don't do it. Period. You're damaging your soul. You can keep damaging it. I mean, that's your personal choice, but you are doing it. It's just a consequence of taking blood. The blood goes into the earth. The earth rebels against it. Ah! Why are you giving me blood? You know, the blood, if it's going to be on the altar, it goes to God. Great. That's fine. But the blood that goes into the earth, no, that's not good. That's wasted. So you see, the life is in the blood and there's an issue here that isn't just scientific but spiritual. And so a lot of times people don't catch that gist of there being something wrong with why we say we have this outward problem of PTSD or all these other things. When in reality, the wrongness is a spiritual matter. They have no peace. They don't have peace anymore. No peace of God. No peace with God. No peace that lasts is never lasting. Now, if you do kill and you have killed, grace be unto you. 
So if you get grace, you can have peace. If you don't have grace, you have no peace. That's what Paul is doing in this demonstration to us and giving this salutation and this Holy Spirit teaching us that we need grace and peace or we need grace to have peace. We need to have that grace of God in our life, grace for grace, mercy for mercy, love for love, forgiveness for forgiveness, so that not only would we do something about it for someone else, it would do something for us. Once we receive grace and we live by grace, every day when we have gotten grace for what we've blown up and blown up and torn up and stomped up and messed up, then that would take care of the guiltiness we feel from the sins that we so easily commit. The grace would cover us because God died for us. God lived that we might be seeing a perfect example of a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. As he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then he goes the extra mile to demonstrate what we should do with our lives by dying to self. He died to his self that he might be resurrected in God's self. And so he ever lives to make intercession for us now at the right hand, seated at the right hand of the Father, so that he might be our high priest, so that we would have the opportunity to ask him to help us. And he would take from God our Father and give to us grace. I was fascinated by how that worked. Wow, that was kind of amazing, wasn't it? I didn't know I was going to get there. Yeah, I mean, that's how he did it. He went, you know, boom, 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 boom. You know, replay that and I'll go, ooh, that's pretty cool. Can we write that down? But that's what Jesus did with his life, with his will, with his way, and with his perfect living example of a sacrifice. By his sacrifice, we now have grace. And we appropriate grace from him, being our high priest, for our daily needs. We need grace because we mess up every day. That's why we can say, Father, forgive us, for we know not what we do. And we can confess our sins so because he's faithful just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness by his grace. By that grace that we're given then, we've been made the peace of God. So we have peace with God by the peace of God that's in our heart. We should not be feeling guilty. You should not. Did you blow it today? Grace be unto you. Now have peace. I don't have peace. Well, then you need more grace. Ask for more grace. Oh, I don't have grace. Well, yeah, you do. But I, I don't get it. Well, yeah, that's why. That's why you don't have peace because you don't have enough grace. Get more grace. See, you need to grasp the idea and the concept here of what grace is, how grace applies, what grace can do for you, and what grace will accomplish. Grace will accomplish the peace of God that passes all understanding, so you'll have peace. That way you won't have to feel bad or guilty or worn out or torn up or bummed out or make up excuses for why you're a sinner, saved by grace. You're a sinner, saved by grace. You can't make up any excuses. You're a sinner, period. You know, you're going to wake up tomorrow, you're going to be a sinner. And you're going to wake up the next day and you're going to be a sinner. And you know what? Every day that you're a sinner, you need grace. So, that's why by grace you're saved. Those that don't have grace, they got no peace. You can see it. They got no peace. They're working it, working it, working it. And you can see it on their face. No peace at all. So, Father, I thank you that you've given us grace. You've given us grace so we can have peace. We can see, oh Lord, that, wow, that's confusing. <laughs> but you made it easy to comprehend of what Jesus did. You gave us something practical we can use every day for our own nature, sinful that it is. You gave us something that we can apply to our lives every day that we can make real in our lives in every way because we need it because today we sin. We are sinners saved by grace. Oh, we're called to be saints, but we're not. We call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, but we're not yet. We do all these things and we are in that church of God that is at Corinth and we are very much so like the Corinthians in every day and in every way. We are as these people that need you, Lord, to have given us grace. And I thank you, Father, that you have given us peace with you because of your grace. That we have the peace of God now from our Lord Jesus Christ and from you because of the grace with which you did what you did with your son and what your son did for us on behalf of your will to be done. Jesus, I thank you that you have given us the will of the Father, which is grace be extended unto us so that we would find you would be able to appropriate for us what we need for the day as well as for all of our lives. And that the one action would only be relevant to the supernatural effect that it has on removing the stain of sin but not causing us to no longer sin, 
but that rather you would forgive us forever until the day that you take us perfect before the Father. And so as you're working that out in our life, I'm thanking you, God, for that grace that goes beyond our comprehension and is being worked out in our lives so that we would be called to be saints and become saints, so that we would be called upon the name of the Lord and be saved, so that we would be looking at Jesus and become like Jesus, so we'd look at you, Father, and be made whole and perfect in your presence. So, God, I thank you for that. By the grace and by the mercy with which you have said, we have, as Corinthians, from you. Amen. Amen? Hey, knock yourself out. Go find some grace today. You'll find it right there in the Word. And you know what? When you take that grace and you run outside and go play, you'll have peace with God. Because God said so.